Okay, I'm going to talk about health students and their presence on social media. They've got their hands full, so why should they be worrying about this extra thing? I hope I can persuade you that it's, it's an interesting thing for them to do. Social media means all sorts of things. I'm just going to be talking about the, the idea of participating in social networks. Okay, I'm going to talk about blogs, which is just writing stuff, essentially, but it's writing it in ways that can be public. And I'm going to talk about using Twitter to um, share blogs. When I put, I wondered why people might blog, and I found that Google says I blog, therefore I am. So I've just followed a philosopher, so I thought that's actually quite apt. Um, there's all sorts of risky things about doing things in public, as Anthony Weiner found out a little while ago, but it doesn't seem to have deterred him too much, because he's still going to put in another bid to become New York's mayor. Um, Obviously, doing silly things like photographing bits of your anatomy and, and sending them to people is a really silly thing to do in some kind of public way. Um, it still doesn't stop people doing it. It's a couple of examples. We've got our very own politicians who make mistakes and do silly things. And I think these things really uh, kind of terrify people about social media. They should terrify them about doing silly things instead of social media. Uh, Emily Thornberry got into huge problems a few months ago when she tweeted a white van. Um, even Prince Charles is in trouble, but not for using social media, for writing stuff. So maybe the message should be not doing you know, silly things, really, rather than not using social media. So my message is don't share anything you wouldn't mind your mum seeing and the rest of the world. Uh, Health students have got a special set of responsibilities, which is why we as educators worry about them and worry about each other. And this is an example of a young woman called Rebecca Layton, who uh, was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Rebecca did nothing wrong, but many of you might remember her and think that she killed people. She didn't. She didn't do the things that she was accused of doing in the papers. But what she did do was she put photographs on her Facebook page, which looked fairly innocuous. Young people put pictures like this on their Facebook pages, but Rebecca was in a hospital where people were being killed, guys on trial at the moment for, for their murder. Um, but her life and her career was wrecked, really seriously wrecked. She's since been found completely innocent. She was struck off the nursing register. She's now back on the nursing register. And she's also um, successfully sued the police for uh, deceptively releasing her photographs and, and messages on Facebook uh, when they didn't have the permission to do that. They were deceptive in what they did, and she's won the case against them. But what we remember is that her name is associated with murdering people. Um, I'm just going to get my water, Fiona. Can I do that? Thank you. Uh, so if she hadn't had a Facebook account, that wouldn't have happened. On the other hand, if the police hadn't duplicitously released those pictures, it still wouldn't have happened. So maybe the message oughtn't to be about not to use Facebook or not to use social media, but should be understanding that the world is, is a dangerous and difficult place when the police release things about you, when they oughtn't to do that. Another, I, I did do a search to see what health students were doing on, and, and health practitioners were doing. Another guy decided to report problems with his hospital through Facebook. Well, clearly that's a silly thing to do. There's all sorts of policies and procedures for reporting concerns in a hospital. You know, a doctor got into trouble. Several doctors are on, on Google for getting into trouble, doing things that they oughtn't to be doing. Maybe now they do them through texts and, and Facebook. Just don't do the silly things, really. And another thing I, th I thought was quite interesting, um, patients, infatuated patients are, are stalking doctors. I don't know if they really are or if that's just a, a good headline, but clearly being open and, and available to people changes the relationships we have with patients. And those are interesting things to think about and things we ought to start engaging with and talking about. Um, because social media is out there, we're not going to stop it being there. So I think having done that bit of work on all the worrying things, my message is life isn't fair. You don't want to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, but sometimes people are. So be very, be very aware that having images of yourself and messages about yourself makes you even more vulnerable. And um, it's not the place to report safety concerns. And we have professional codes to help us and support us. 
which I'm going to talk about now. Hot off the press is the Nursing and Midwifery's uh, guidance on using social media. None of our professional bodies say don't use it. They say use it responsibly. Um, <clears throat> so here's a whole raft of other sets of guidance to help people use social media responsibly. These guides wouldn't be there if it wasn't already quite a big deal for people. People are using it. So we've got here the Health Professions Council's guidance, uh, the General Medical Council's set of guidance, and everything comes down to fitness to practice. So my message to health students and health practitioners is uh, know your existing codes, know your existing codes of professional conduct, and simply extend those to using social media. Don't do anything on social media that you wouldn't do face to face with somebody. Um, so those are there and use them. So if there are all these problems, why are there so many people still using social media? The first person I want to talk about, and I will treat her later on to tell her that I've talked about her, is a woman called Anne-Marie Cunningham. And she does incredibly inspiring things. She's a, a GP and she teaches, and these are her 10 reasons why any doctor, and I would say any health professional, should explore social media. Uh, Anne-Marie says it's about connecting, it's engaging, it's informing, it's reflecting, sharing, being challenged, and you see that in the conversations that people have. Being supported, and you see that in the conversations that people have. To lead, and the interesting thing for me is that this isn't about leading in hierarchical or managerial ways. This is truly leading in terms of the way people are thinking and reconceptualizing things. Learning is huge and inspiring. I'm inspired by loads of the people that I'm going to introduce you to. And there's a bit more about Anne-Marie for anyone who <coughs> is interested in, um, in following her. This is her webpage, Wishful Thinking and Medical Education. And the video is about a mother whose son died in the care of um, a local authority. So this begins to say how easily social media breaks down boundaries, traditional boundaries between doctors, health professionals, patients, parents, relatives. And that can, for me, can only be an incredibly good thing. Here's one of our own students who got blogging while she was a student here, Tracy Davis, now working in A&E in Winchester. <clears throat> and um, I, I'm meeting Tracy for coffee in a couple of days' time. This is someone who is one of our peers, and she's now blogging about being a nurse in a completely <clears throat> professional and um, responsible way. One of our uh, occupational therapists, <clears throat> Jenny, has blogged about uh, unusual placements, emerging placements. We've got a student physio who's blogging. Andrea Shaw is a student nurse who blogs um, and tweets and has conversations with all sorts of interesting and, and helpful people. And there's her blog. Katie is another student nurse who's looking to create a network of blogging nursing students. I can't persuade you that this is a good or a bad thing to do. What I can invite you to do is have a look at their blogs. Uh, practitioners who I learn lots from include uh, a GP in South London called Jonathan Tomlinson. And Jonathan's blogs are just incredibly powerful. I don't know how long, well, <clears throat> I think it takes about two years to get a professional, uh, to get an article published in, a, in, a, in an academic journal. These blogs go out instantly. People talk about things as they're happening. <clears throat> Darren Gormley. Uh, is a healthcare support worker with older people. Great blogger. You know, just take a look and you will, you will begin to understand why I want my health students to start reading people's blogs. They get different perspectives, perspectives they could never um, get just by, just by being in, in lectures. Our own Anne Bruton, who's probably blogging away as we speak in Building 45. Um, this is a, a, a medic called Phil Berry, who writes a blog called Illusions of Autonomy. And a lovely blogger, really lovely blogs about small incidents in practice that just say more than um, you know, a, a kind of formal text could say. And Margaret McCartney, very, very well known, you know, big author. Margaret is, is, is a, a brilliant person to follow. Now, this is in this room. This is a woman called Alison Cameron, 
who lectured in this very room to a couple of hundred student nurses, thanks to Trevor Kettle, who's in the Faculty of Health Sciences, who is our lead for um, user involvement. Alison does a really interesting thing. Alison actually blogs and tweets through um, her own health experiences. And there's a conference soon in uh, Belfast looking at blogging and tweeting around personal health issues. Anya de Jong is another person who works with us in our, in our Clark, and she um, writes a blog called The Patient Patient about self-management, managing long-term conditions. Absolutely brilliant. Bermintrude chooses to remain anonymous, and she's a social worker who um, is one of the country's top bloggers. Or she was. She stopped blogging at the moment. And Bermintrude chats and has conversations. If you just look her up, she, you know, she's a, a brilliant person to actually see how, why, and how people follow her. She's she's just incredibly wise and thoughtful and controversial. And um, finally, Marie Ennis O'Connor is. Uh, someone who also blogs about having had experiences, extensive experiences of health services and gives a really unique perspective and actually says that the, the, the kind of crowdsourcing of help through social media is part and parcel of her recovery. These are the communities that we've got going. We Nurses was started by um, a nurse, an agency nurse, who simply felt very isolated as an agency nurse and now it's massive. We've got We AHPs, um, these are the kinds of things they, they will tweet about. And every week, people have conversations which are about clinical things or managerial things or, you know, various things. You can have a look. Social media can change things, and it does change things. And here in our audience, somewhere is Gary. <laughs> um, this is one of the things that's happening right here. Through the use of Facebook, Gary and Lance have been working together many miles apart for four years. We're not talking about, you know, um, this isn't just something that we've, we've just thought of. And their students interact through Facebook entirely and learn about each other's worlds. And I can't think of anything more exciting to do. And on, in our conversation a couple of days ago, Lance said it helps his students imagine a world outside of their own state. Now, that's, a, that's an interesting and good thing to do. And finally, for me, is um, a woman called Kate Granger, who's a doctor, but she's, <clears throat> she's got a, a, a terminal illness and she's very poorly. And Kate's a big blogger and a big tweeter. And um, she was admitted to hospital a little while ago and found that people did things to her without saying who they were. So she started this campaign just called Hello My Name Is. And anybody in health services will recognise this. This has gone absolutely stratospheric. It's, it's a, now a major campaign that people say to a patient, hello, my name is Julie, how are you? And that's, that's really, really taken off and that's entirely through Kate's use of social media. So that's, <clears throat> that's it from me, really. I hope I've persuaded you that there are interesting people to follow and interesting things to do. But social media is not a kind of paddling pool in the back garden. It's like the sea. And that's great. That beach and that sea looks amazingly tempting to go and, and swim in. So my final message is just, it can be rough too. <laughs> Thank you.